Good afternoon, everyone. There's a lot of familiar faces here. <laughs> Skylight shot. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. There's a lot of familiar faces here, some new ones as well, which is good. Um, so, uh, I'm Graham Taylor um, from the Chapter Space University, and this is Paul Nizankov from about 100 metres that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's far. <laughs> Um, and we're here to talk to, talk to you about the OASIS project, formally titled Establishment of a Spaceport Network Architecture. You understand why it had that title in a minute. Um, so, this started off as um, an International Space University su Space Studies Program um, team project this summer um, in Florida. It was hosted at the Florida Institute of Technology, and we were working with NASA Kennedy Space Center on it. Um, we had some chairs there, and uh, Wiley Larson was our chair, some of you might know that name. Um, so there was 34 people in our team from 19 different countries, so it's quite a culturally diverse team. Um, and we worked on it over the course of about nine weeks. Um, so we produced this OASIS report, and there, there's the OASIS Next, which is a subset of this, these people um, carrying on this project and developing it further and hoping to take it <coughs> elsewhere. So we're just going to start with a quick introductory video um, introducing you to the concept of what a spaceport network is, um, and then we'll go from there. So as you can see, networks have been prevalent throughout transportation, throughout most of human history. Um, and we're just exploring into transportation, into the new environment of space. Um, now, when it comes to any activities in space, there's one classic problem. Access to space is expensive. Um, and that, that affects almost every conceivable thing you can do in space. Um, now, just to establish some context as to what, how this project was um, understanding the future, we were basing it around the International Space um, Exploration Coordination Group, the Global Exploration Roadmap. This is a document from all the space agencies across the world, kind of agreeing as to how they're going to explore the solar system in the future. Um, all these situations require large mass into space. When I say space, I don't just mean orbit, I mean various locations in space. Also, from the commercial context, 
Um, less expensive access to space will open up these new markets. You've probably all heard this before, and it's, it's a pretty established fact that getting into space cheaper will allow more things to, to happen. So this is where the OASIS network comes in. OASIS actually stands for Operations and Ser Service Infrastructure for Space. Now, the basic premise of it is taking the, the services, infrastructure and capabilities offered by spaceports on Earth and then transferring them to spaceports in space. So, breaking down the traditional barriers that the spaceport is somewhere on Earth. This will introduce the concept of a spaceport network. So there'll be lots of spaceports at different locations in space and you'll be able to go between the two of them and break up your journey and it will allow much easier access to different locations in space. Um, as a spaceport network helps you get somewhere, hence our slogan, servicing you on your way to the stars. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, <coughs> the basic elements of the OASIS project that we understood during the CP so the first thing we want to do, if we're transferring these capabilities into space, what are these capabilities? So we did a survey of all the existing spaceports on Earth, identified their functions, capabilities and services, and um, what services they, are, they provide and how, how many are provided in which locations. Then we will assess potential market opportunities for these services elsewhere in space. So what are the markets for the tug services, what are the markets for refueling services and things like that. And then from there, we went on to select appropriate locations, optimised locations, for these nodes to provide these services. Looking at both the explorational, governmental explorational market, as well as commercial market as well. This, this whole network is designed to be a commercial network. It's not, um, it's not one funded by government, it's selling services to the government, so it's a commercial entity. And then finally, we went on to uh, propose a roadmap for how this should be done over the course of the next 50 years. And now I'm going to pass over to Paul, who's going to explain this, um, this roadmap that we came up with. Alright, so in this, in this picture you can see basically our proposed network architecture. Um, we focused on three nodes, each with a different time phasing. For the first phase we envisioned the node to be in low of orbit, with certain um, services which we offer during the first phase. For the second phase, the moon surface, which adds more services to the to the whole network, and finally, with completion at the at the Phobos Martian moon, the third node, which will basically enable all the services that, that we envision for the network. Another analogy, since Graham was mentioning a lot of transportation networks, is the metro map analogy. So here you can easily see, yeah, I mean it's easier than the Stuttgart one. So. So you can see different services and also different destinations with our notes and group, of course. Alright, now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of the design of the first, of the, of the notes. So for the first node in Law of Orbit, we envisioned uh, basically an orbital platform which connects elements like water tanks and the tax servicer. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail later. You can also see uh, mass and power breakdown as part of a feasibility study. So with this system we envision to be highly modular, so we can extend into the needs and yeah, if there if there are needs. So here you can see a little bit more detail. This is this could be like one module, and then you can just stack them together, like you can see with the docking adapter. So on top you can see the water tank, which is protected by a heat shield. Then you can also see the solar panels, which are extended to the side, and the tug, which is connected to the propellant generation, where we produce from water, on demand, cryogenic fuel. I'm going to go back one slide to show you actually that this basically always is, they're always uh, turned around every, every module, so to avoid shading on the solar panels, so I was even looked into that detail. Alright, so the tug servicer itself is capable of tugging 9 tons into geo from the law of orbit. It is reusable with a deployable air braking device and it's going to be teleoperated from Earth. <coughs> from Earth. So here we can also see a mass breakdown which is <coughs> part of the feasibility study. Alright, now we're going to show you a short video again okay. about the concept of operations. Here you can see the the node 1, which right now probably produces propellant for the upcoming missions. 
So a satellite is launched into low Earth orbit, as you can see. Satellite. <laughs> yeah, we're following the trend of mini miniaturization of spacecraft. <laughs> All right, so a target service, which is fuel, fuel, um, uh, fuel, <laughs> with fuel, <laughs> is docking with a satellite, as you can see, it's a pretty small one. And then is propelled into the geotransfer orbit with a tug. And then put into orbit by the tax service. So after the satellite is in the right orbit and is released, and the tug service returns to uh, to the platform in law for using error breaking, which is also being, uh, for example, studied here at the University of Stuttgart. Alright, this is the end. Okay. okay, now the time returns, it is ready for another mission uh, after it is reviewed. Alright, <clears throat> so while for the first note we mainly focused on the on the enabling easier access to space. For the second note, we envisioned the introduction of resources into the, into the whole network, and also the utilization of resources already available in the inner solar system. So we decided to place the second note on the moon surface. Um, here, the key, key elements, as you can see, is a reusable moon, moon shuttle, which is going to transport the water and the propellant into the low lunar orbit from the moon surface. Then we also, of course, have regular excavators and haulers, a launch and landing pad for the mentioned moon shuttle, the regular processing facilities, water and propellant generation, and the storage for propellant and water. The propellant, gen the water generation was designed for the to to be able to calculate a, basically a price on the water on from the moon. So we designed it to be 150 tons of water per year. So, how is this different from all these other studies which do also utilize resources on the moon with a very high price tag? This is basically focusing on miniaturized robotics which are paving the way and not necessarily manned in a manned outpost. So, here you can also see the total mass and also an initial investment range since it's very speculative. We decided to give a range which is in the billions. But considering this to be a, an international global project with maybe 10 countries for over 10 years, this reduces the amount which each country has to spend to some hundred millions, which is affordable. And yes. <laughs> Alright, so the third note on Phobos, as you can see, there are no mass estimations for that, but it facilitates easy access to the Mars surface. The reason why we um, decided not to place um, this, the third node on the Mars surface because of the difficulties on bringing uh, a lot of mass onto the surface because of re-entry. Um, and also we could use the technology we use for node 2, again for the Phobos node, and the pot potential water resources here would be Mars crossing asteroids or asteroids in the main node, which either would be transported to the Mars orbit or the propellant will be generated on the way from, from the asteroid itself. Okay, this is basically is completing the extension of the network into the inner solar system and will hopefully enable missions beyond. Alright, and since I already saw some people laughing in the back, Graham is going to present why, why that is a viable <laughs> as a business case. Okay, so as we said at the beginning, this is meant to be undertaken as a commercial project. Um, it's something that's economically sustainable and although requires um, initial investment, I just got an email apparently. Um, <laughs> um, uh, although it, can, it does require initial investment, that's on the scale of commercial companies being able to do it. It's a phased approach so that the previous phase can fund the next, the next one. Um, so, the first node one, um, the investment wasn't too large, about 250 million to 500 million dollars. Um, 
And the, that, the way that makes money is through the tug services from the commercial satellite sector. So the geo, um, the geo services are explained a bit more why this is viable on the next slide. And also the possibility of um, governmental contracts refueling exploration and stuff like that. For node two, this is augmented. It's still serving the same market, but it's serving it from the, the cheaper, the, the less the <coughs> expensive um, source of in situ resource utilization by planets on the moon. Um, and then also, um, servicing other markets in the side of the space. And then node 3, similar to node 2, but in the vicinity of Mars. Um, for all the numbers, um, feel free to check out our, our IAC paper or the full report, which is on our website, which you'll see later. Um, so, node 1, where is it making its money from? So, currently, when you place a geo spacecraft um, into orbit, it's, it requires uh, one launcher, it takes you straight there, and you have to buy a launcher that's big enough. If we, um, if we are able to provide this tug service, you can choose, it allows, allows the use of smaller launch vehicles, access to the geo market, as well as, as, well as allowing you to utilize the, the launcher to its full capacity. Um, if you have a three ton spacecraft, and you know, the launcher is available to use a four and a half ton, that's one and a half ton of wasted mass. Um, so you potentially, um, add water to this that will be collected by the tug servicer and then used for fuel on a future mission um, and that allows full utilisation of the launcher, launcher capability. There's also, let's say, the opportunity to um, provide refueling for exploration missions and things like that. And also things like active debris removal that may be required in the future. That's another market for our tug servicer. No two value proposition. Again, as I just explained, it's there's, there's many studies by NASA that have been done that say it will be less expensive to source consumables, water, cryogenic components from the loop, from the loop using lunar regolith. Um, and also, there's potential for other um, regolith derived products. Um, for instance, they're doing a study right now on heat shields made from lunar regolith. Okay, and then finally, how would this happen in a regulatory environment? Now, some of you who do ISU students and here with Professor Zerbos this lecture the other day, he said, ISU team projects always propose this magical solution of some treaty that will make everything okay. So guess what we did? Um, so the way it will be structured is the, um, the, piece, the, the first, there is no regulatory environment for this to exist currently. So this would need to be established. The Atlas Space Treaty doesn't really cover this. For instance, um, it's more akin to maritime law. If you have a spacecraft who needs help, um, can you refuse that help or not, and that kind of thing. So th these kind of laws would need to be transferred into the space arena. Um, that would probably require a new, a new treaty, we're calling it the International Space Ports Authority um, Treaty, and then that would create this regulatory body, the ISDA. They would then, um, propose the, this network of spaceports and, and ask private companies to provide capital and also cha um, channel the capital of um, governmental organisations as well. And then it would be offer, operated on a, a, kind of a, uh, a private entity, similar to the way Ariane Spass has done. Um, so just to conclude, the, the products of this, um, this project were defining the optimised network um, in, over this 40, 50 year time span to provide these services. Um, at the three nodes, Leo, Moon, and Martian Moon Phobos, and then um, show how this can lower the overall cost of access to space, as well as boosting commercial markets as well. This, this solution is flexible depending on the uh, policy environment, um, how the global exploration roadmap is chosen to proceed, whether they go for the moon first or the asteroid first or whatever. And say all this and more is um, in a 100 page full report on our website, Oasis Next. So feel free to go and have a look at that. And, and these are just all the people who would like to thank from NASA who helped us out and other places. And then, are there any questions? <laughs> any hard questions we're directing to the other team members who are <laughs> I think you sold your project, so no questions left. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll ask a question <laughs> <laughs> A bit about the production of how you actually plan on producing cryogenic propellant in orbit. I, I, in orbit? Yeah. 
I would, I would direct that back to the member of the science team who's in the audience, so you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, the... Okay, so the propellant is produced on orbit uh, by electrolysis and then cooling it down to the necessary temperature. Which is pretty straightforward, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it, it, it hasn't been done before, but it's one of the critical technologies to identify, so... There, there are studies looking into this. Um, NASA have done many studies looking into whether this is viable. And they generally come to the conclusion that it is definitely viable. And one, one of the reasons we, why, we, why we chose um, on orbit propellant production was to reduce the boil load so we don't have to store the cryogenics for a long, long period of time. Um, and also, one of the big, bigger advantages was so we could, could launch water and not propellant, which would reduce logistics, uh, price of insurance, and stuff like that. Anyone else? No, we are blowing you away. This is just boring.